When we have categorical data, or data that's words, pictures, images, characters of some sort, there are a few different ways that we can summarize them. We can display them with tables, or bar charts, or pie charts. So this first case that we're going to look at here is for if we collected a single categorical variable. So what we did here is collected eye color, and this table that we're summarizing in here is called a frequency table. And frequency is just another word for count, so it's just counting how many values. So how we could read this is the number of people in this group that had blue eyes. There were five people that have blue eyes, 13 that have brown eyes, two that have green eyes, and three that are being categorized as other. Now, with the data summarized like this, it might not look like categorical data, but if you imagine that I had sent out a survey and collected information, asked the question like, what color are your eyes? Then my data, how it would look originally is I would see these words written down. Students would answer brown, blue, another student would have brown, green, other. So the original data set itself would actually be in words, but how I've summarized it here is with a frequency table so that we can just get an idea of how many times are we seeing certain words rather than this listed out form. So everything there and cutting off to the left is called a frequency table. We could expand this table and create a relative frequency table by looking at the percentages. So something we might want to do here is look at the total. So if I go back to my frequency table side of this, I could look at total and add up the frequencies. So 5 plus 13 plus 2 plus 3, which would give me 23. And that would give me my sample size. I surveyed 23 people, and this is how the eye colors dispersed. So relative frequency would let me look at the percentages of this group. So what we would use is a fraction made out of the frequency and our sample size. So for blue eyes, what I would do is take 5 out of 23. And plugging that into the calculator, we'd want a decimal form, which would be a 0.2174. Now, as a little review of changing decimals to percentages, which is something we'll use a lot in this section, and um, especially with probability, if you have your decimal form of the number, which is what we'll most often be working with, if we want the percentage form, you need to move the decimal to the right two spaces. So we're going to have a decimal end up landing right there. So when you have your decimal form, be sure to round to four decimal places. So then when we have the percentage form of the number, we can see to two decimal places. So this would be 21.74% with that new spot that we landed at with our decimal. So just to show you, I'll write the decimals over to this right-hand side. So if we take 13 out of 23, we'll have a 0.5652. So that'll be a 56.52%. Um, two out of 23, which would be a 0.087. So moving that decimal to the right two places would be an 8.7%. And then other 3 out of 23, which would be a 0 0.1304, but changing that to the percentage form, 13.04%. And if you add all of these up, if you add up the relative frequencies, it should add up to 100%, covering our whole sample size that we looked at. So sometimes the percentage form can be better so that um, if I was comparing the distribution of eye color to another class, but it had a different sample size, comparing percentages across different sample sizes is easier. To say one class had about 57% brown eyes, and then if I have another class but only knew the count, like they said, well, five students had brown eyes in that class, it's hard to compare. But if you have percentages, you can compare across the groups a little more easily. So that's a relative frequency table, is when you add in these percentages by taking the frequencies divided by sample size. So let's talk about two different ways to graph data. 
with the bar chart, we'll use frequency, and with the pie charts, we'll use relative frequency. So with the pie chart, we'll, or sorry, with the bar chart, we'll need x and y axes, similar to how we drew our histogram. And along the x-axis, we'll have our data, which in this case is eye color. And what we'll want to do is, it's not necessarily called bins, but we'll want to create a space for each category. It's like we have blue eyes, brown eyes, green eyes, and other. So what I'm going to do is create a little space for blue and leave a gap between the bars. There should be space between them. So a little bit of space and then brown, a little space and then green. and a little space for other. And then along the y-axis, we're going to have frequency. So I'm going to create a number line here, and I need to see up to 13. So I'm going to go by twos here. Let's go 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. and then we'll create the bars. So blue had a frequency of five. So I'm gonna draw a bar that goes up to five. I went way too far there. One more time. Five is down there. It's a little slanted. Um, brown eyes at 13. So we're gonna drop to 13. Green eyes, two. And other, three. So with that, we get a summary of our data. Um, we have our categories, so it isn't a number line. Like we, when we had a histogram, it was because we had numerical data that we had a number line along the x-axis, but because this is categorical, we have these categories. Um, and then the y-axis is frequency for both of them. All right, pie chart is going to use the relative frequencies. So what we're going to do is we'll have a circle. And what we're going to do is divide up the circle based on the percentages as best we can. We're just going to eyeball it. So I'm actually going to start with brown eyes since that's fairly close to half. So what I'm going to do is just imagine that if I cut that down. Here's half. Let's say I'm putting brown eyes to the left-hand side here. So I'm just going to give them a little bit more than half. So this would be brown eyes. So we want to label the category. And we also want to put the percentage in there so that we know how it distributes. Let's see. Blue eyes is a little less than a fourth of the class. So fourth would be 25%. So like if I cut across here, that would be a fourth of the pie. And I'm just gonna go a bit less. So really I'm just using percentages that I know, that I can see, and then adjusting from there. And then in terms of green and other, I'm just going to separate it so that there's a small one and a larger one. <laughs> this isn't exact. There is a way of doing this with protractors and all that, but we're just going to get as close as we can. So green is the small one of 8.7% and other with 13.04%. So with that, then you have a visual for how it distribute, distributes across your sample, um, seeing large percentages and smaller percentages. Some questions that we can ask with categorical data deals with proportions, which proportion is just another word for percentages. So like when this asks what proportion of the group has blue eyes, this is linking to the relative frequencies. So this comes from that calculation of five people in this group had blue eyes out of all 23 people, so 0.2174. And then how we're going to deal with 
decimals and percentages in this class. In terms of calculation, we'll be working in decimal form. A lot of the formulas that we're going to get, and this is going to link very closely to probability, which we're covering next. Um, mathematically, we want to work with decimals. When we get to a sentence answer, though, in the sentence answer, let's write as a percentage because that's more how that's more common in terms of how we speak. So I wouldn't say like 0.2174 people have blue eyes. It's easier to speak in percentage form. So we'd say 21.74% of the sample or of the group has blue eyes. And that just makes a bit more sense. So um, this is how I'm going to write up solutions. I suggest you work this way too. Calculation is going to come from fraction and decimal, sentence written as a percentage. When you're working in My Open Math and it wants solutions, it isn't putting it in a sentence form. My Open Math typically wants this decimal form of answers. And this will be true for probabilities as well. So if you're doing calculations of a proportion or percentage, typically you'll write in the decimal. The only time they'll want a percentage in my open math is if they leave you the answer box and put the percentage symbol outside of it, then you would want to type in 21.74. But if there isn't that percentage symbol, then typically you're typing in that 0.2174. What proportion of the group has green or brown eyes? Now, when we work in this section and with probability, um, or is typically going to relate to addition. Green eyes, or brown eyes, or even both when we get to probability, but both isn't a case here. So what we're going to do is add those two values together. So it's like there's this total of 15 students that have green or brown eyes, which is coming from those two students with brown eyes, or sorry, two students with green eyes plus the 13 with brown eyes. So with that, we'd have a 0.6522. So we would make a sentence that said 65.22% of the group has green or brown eyes. So these graphs and these questions all deal with a single variable. And how I know it's a single variable is if I go back to how I drew my data here, how I imagine my data would be listed, it would be a single column of data. It's all collected under eye color. So what we want to do next is look at what if we had another variable. So this is a case of two categorical variables, and how we're going to combine that is in a contingency table which can also be called a two-way table. So in this data set, what they collected um, from a statistics class is whether or not students like espresso and whether or not they like chocolate. And then what we have on the outside are the totals. So what I'm going to do is even, it can help to visualize the table with the totals a bit separated because the numbers tell us different things. There's kind of two parts to this table. We have our overall sample size in this kind of grand total of 23 students that were asked. And then what we have are two regions. So what we have along the outside here with the totals, so like that 18 and 5 and that 15 and 8, those are called the margins. And those margins deal in terms of a single variable. Meaning reading this, I would have 18 students like chocolate. In that 18, it doesn't matter whether or not they like espresso. We don't have that second variable there. This is all about liking chocolate. And these five students don't like chocolate. So these two numbers just tell me about preference of chocolate. Whereas if I move to this right hand side, 15 students like espresso. So now I'm talking in terms of espresso without any information of it doesn't matter whether or not they like chocolate. This is just about liking espresso. And eight students don't like espresso. So on the outside here, these will deal with marginal values, which will ask questions in terms of a single variable. 
So for example, and this is starting to link to probabilities, and we'll deal with probabilities in terms of a table like this, what proportion of the students like chocolate? So with this, it's just asking about a single variable. So we'll go to the margins, and we want this grand total of 18 students that like chocolate out of the 23 total students, which would be a 0.7826. So 78.26% of the students like chocolate. Another example, what proportion of the students do not like espresso? Again, they're not mentioning chocolate here at all, so this is just one variable. So we'd want to look at the margins and get this grand total of eight total students do not like espresso. So we have eight out of 23, which is a 0.3478. So 34.78% of the students do not like espresso. So these are called marginal probabilities, and it deals with the values that are listed in the margins, and it's in terms of a single variable. Our other region of this table is in the middle here, that 11, 7, 1, and 4. These are called the joint values, which deal with two variables. So this 11 right here, there are 11 students that like espresso and like chocolate. So it's this intersection of two values. These seven students like chocolate, but do not like espresso. So we're getting two pieces of information for each of those values in the middle there. So some questions that could come up here, what proportion of the class likes espresso and likes chocolate. So the word and commonly comes up with these questions and it's asking for the intersection of those two values. So it wants to know what's the probability of both occurring. So, or in this case, what proportion for both. So if we want this intersection of liking chocolate and liking espresso, that's that 11 students that we talked about. So 11 students like both out of 23, so that'd be a 0.4783. So 47.83% of the students. And then to follow, I'm just copying the wording here. In fact, I'll fill this in later for the sake of time, but of the students or of the class likes espresso and chocolate. So what's nice about these questions, as well as with probability, in forming your sentence answers, you can usually recycle some of the original question. What proportion of the class does not like espresso and does not like chocolate? So we want the intersection of those two events. So does not like espresso, so it's in this row, does not like chocolate in that column, so that's going to be that one student right there that doesn't like either. So 1 out of 23 for a 0 0.0435. So these are joint probabilities, and it's looking at the intersection of two variables. So, and most often what you'll see is the word and for connecting those two events. So wanting to see the probability of one and the other ends up being this kind of probability of both. And the last thing we're going to talk about here just a little bit is a conditional probability. And with that, they're telling us a condition. So something's being given. We're going to know something is already true. Um, so the word given sometimes shows up, or you might even see the word if sometimes. Actually, neither of those show up in this case, but when we get to conditional probability, we'll look at examples with that wording. This is what proportion of the students that like chocolate also like espresso. What they're doing is they're setting a condition of, in terms of who we're looking at. So what proportion of the students that like chocolate? So it's the idea of if these students were sitting in my classroom, what I would say is I want all of the students that like chocolate to stay. Everyone who does not like chocolate, leave the room. So what that would do in terms of my data set is if I go back to my table, 
is I'm removing the students that do not like chocolate. So essentially, I'm doing this. And I'm only looking at these 18 students. And I want to know of them, what proportion of them also like espresso. So what this does is it changes my sample size. So what ends up happening is I only want to look at those 18 students that like chocolate. So it changes this denominator. And I'm not using 23 anymore. I'm using 18 because of the condition. I want to know of that group how many like espresso. So if I'm only looking at that column, well, 11 of them like espresso out of those 18. So this would be an 11 out of 18 to get a 0.6111. So it's this idea of liking both of the things out of those that are in the condition that we're looking at. We'll talk about this idea much more. I just wanted to introduce it a little bit. So phrasing this, I would say 61.11% of the students that like chocolate, so of that group that likes chocolate, also like espresso. So that's how we can organize categorical data. But here's also a little introduction linking to probability, which we'll go into further in the next videos.